Question. What is big? Long, hard, and juicy? Answer. Tesla's master plan, part three. If you own Tesla stock, this is required reading. In this video, we're going through Tesla's entire master plan, part three, close to 100 pages. If I cared about offending people, I wouldn't be so offensive, but I don't care about offending people, so I will be so offensive. If you own Tesla stock and you're unwilling to spend the time looking at their master plan, part three, considering the implications, stress testing their assumptions, you are a moron. There's nothing wrong with being a moron, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand. If you own Tesla stock, you need to understand this. Tesla has done the math on transitioning the entire world to sustainable energy generation, storage, and supply. Master plan part three is the math. And we Tesla stock investors can look at Tesla's assumptions and make some assumptions of our own, huh? Could Tesla possibly make that product? Wait, how many of those are sold every year? What if Tesla was to capture 10% of that opportunity or 20% or so on? As I said in the intro, this, at least for many of you, will be hard. But sometimes hard things are necessary. There are some very, very juicy insights later in this report, so make sure you stick around until the end or you'll deeply regret it. Speaking of regrets, you'll probably regret not joining Patreon with the card in the corner or the link in the pinned comment. In addition to over 300 exclusive videos and still counting fast, there's optional access to my Tesla valuation model, which shows my assumptions for Tesla, vehicle production, average selling prices, vehicle models, total addressable markets for each vehicle, autonomy, robo taxis, average cost per mile. I could go on and on and on and on and on. So if you're not a member of Patreon, you can join with the card in the corner or the link in the pinned comment or forever regret it. Master plan part three, sustainable energy for all of earth. In short, Tesla has done the math. Here's the math. This is an absolutely monstrous document. If you guys and girls want to follow along, there's a link in the description to the full master plan. We're just gonna run through some highlights. There are three main components here. First of all, electricity demand. How much electricity will actually be necessary for a fully electrified economy? Then, electricity supply. Oh, and by the way, if you guys and girls can't read between the lines, just about everything in this document is something that Tesla is either A, doing now, B, planning on doing, or C, may do in the future. So in terms of electricity supply, how do we construct the lowest cost portfolio of electricity generation and storage resources that satisfy hourly electricity demand? And a quick aside, if you guys want a little bit more detail on this stuff, check out some of the research from Rethink X. Shout out to Tony Sieber and co. And third, material feasibility and investment. In short, how much shit is actually necessary to make the shit that we need to transition the entire economy to sustainable energy generation, storage, and supply? This paper finds a sustainable energy economy is technically feasible, and this is very important, and requires less investment and less material extraction than continuing today's unsustainable energy economy. This is a very important point. A lot of people have this perception in their mind that transitioning to a sustainable energy economy will come at greater cost. Well, it's better for the environment, but it's gonna cost more. This is false. This will be cheaper and better. Talk about winning. And here's what's required. Around 240 terawatt hours of storage. Shout out to the Tesla investors. This might be a good opportunity for you to do some math and think, hmm, I wonder what percentage of all of that storage will be produced by Tesla. I wonder how much revenue that might be. I highly encourage you to do the math. I know most of you won't, but if you really wanna understand the opportunity in front of Tesla, I really do recommend using the calculator in your brain a little bit, even if it hurts. Around 30 terawatts of renewable power, about a $10 trillion manufacturing investment. It will require half the energy of today's unsustainable energy economy, about one-fifth of 1% 1 of land area on Earth, e.g. for solar, wind, and so on, and around 10% investment of 2022 world GDP. In other words, extremely feasible and a much lower investment than most people would imagine. The current energy economy is wasteful. A lot of people will be unaware of this and we're gonna get super nerdy, but don't worry guys, girls, if you think you're gonna fall asleep, stick in there. There's some major, major, major insights into Tesla's future product roadmap just around the corner. But this is really important as a foundation. Around 37% of energy on Earth today is consumed before making it to the end consumer. This includes the fossil fuel industry's self-consumption during the extraction and refining processes and transformation losses during electricity generation. Another 27% is lost by inefficient end uses such as internal combustion engine vehicles and natural gas furnaces. Only 36% of the primary energy supply produces useful work or heat for the economy. If there's any nerds, feel free to pause and let this one sink in. The point, approximately two thirds of all energy created on earth today 
It doesn't do useful work. It's ridiculous. Only 36%. And it's important to understand, for example, electric vehicles are much more efficient than internal combustion engine vehicles in terms of waste versus useful energy. The plan to eliminate fossil fuels. The following six steps show the actions needed to fully electrify the economy and eliminate fossil fuel use. One, repower the existing grid with renewables. Remember, everything we hear in this report, just think, hmm, is Tesla doing this already? Will they do this in the future? Could they do this in the future? Switch to electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are approximately four times more efficient than internal combustion engine vehicles due to higher powertrain efficiency, regenerative braking capability, and optimized platform design. Again, we're gonna move through this at a relatively quick pace, otherwise this is gonna be four hours and 20 minutes long. If you wanna pause and soak it up, or better yet, run through the original PDF in tandem, go for your life. The plan to eliminate fossil fuels. As a specific example, Tesla's Model 3 energy consumption is 131 miles per gallon equivalent versus a Toyota Corolla with 34 miles per gallon, or 3.9 times lower, and the ratio increases when accounting for upstream losses such as the energy consumption related to extracting and refining fuel. So check this out, a chart really paints the picture. In blue here, we've got the actual energy consumed from driving the vehicle. Quite a difference between the Model 3 and the Corolla. I mean, it's literally no contest. And remember, this energy costs money. Either gasoline, in the case of the Toyota Corolla, or electricity, in the case of the Tesla. Now, don't know if you guys and girls know this, but um, it's a little bit cheaper to recharge a vehicle than it is to refuel a vehicle. Meaning, owning the vehicle is much cheaper as well. One of the big benefits of being far more efficient. But when you factor in upstream losses as well, the disparity grows. I mean, look at this thing, just visually. Switch to heat pumps. I just wanted to take a moment to repeat that. Switch to heat pumps in residential business and industry. Hmm, heat pumps. Does Tesla currently make heat pumps? Actually, they do in their vehicles. Shout out to the Octo Valve heat pump. Tesla has experience producing extremely efficient heat pumps. They don't yet produce heat pumps for homes or commercial or industry, but they could. And in order to transition the entire world to sustainable energy generation, storage and supply, someone needs to make the heat pumps. So uh, if you can't read between the lines, that's unfortunate for you. If you guys wanna nerd out on the diagram of how heat pumps work, I recommend it. Heat pumps use around three times less energy than gas furnaces. So I mean, this is really low hanging fruit. There's no chance Tesla would ever pick this low hanging fruit. We now have a comparison between heat pumps and gas furnaces, just like the Model 3 versus the Corolla. Energy consumption of a heat pump plus upstream losses versus those of a gas furnace. It's no fucking contest. Again, this is one of those things that may surprise people, but it's important to understand. Far less energy will be required to do the same job. Energy equals cost. Therefore, less energy equals less cost. And an important note here, in terms of the industrial sector. Industrial processes up to 200 degrees Celsius, such as food, paper, textile, and wood industries can also benefit from the efficiency gains offered by heat pumps. Four, electrify high temperature heat delivery and hydrogen production. Industrial processes that require high temperatures, e.g. greater than 200 degrees Celsius, account for the remaining 55% of fossil fuel use. That's a lot, I mean, hello, more than half. And requires special consideration. This includes steel, chemical, fertilizer, and cement production, among others. On-site thermal storage may be valuable to cost-effectively accelerate industrial electrification, e.g. directly using the thermal storage media and radiative heating elements. Again, if you're a nerd and want to pause, highly recommend it. Now, I can see people starting to lose their minds already with mention of hydrogen. We'll talk more about this in a moment, but let's read on. Today, hydrogen is produced from coal, oil, and natural gas, and is used in the refining of fossil fuels notably diesel, and in various industrial applications. Green hydrogen can be produced via the electrolysis of water, which is high energy intensity, and no carbon-containing products are consumed or produced. Read closely here. To conservatively estimate electricity demand for green hydrogen, the assumption is no hydrogen will be needed for fossil fuel refining going forward, because uh, there'll be no fossil fuels. And I just want to take a moment here. Creating hydrogen via electrolysis of water it does work, but it is extremely wasteful in terms of energy. And this is why it's absolutely fucking insane to think it makes sense to have hydrogen powered vehicles. There will be some extremely unusual cases in which it's necessary to use hydrogen. We have to understand the extreme inefficiency of the process of converting water to hydrogen means there's so much energy involved when there are alternatives that are much more economical, it's better to use those. Now, the caveat here, at some point in the future, Earth will enter an era of energy abundance. When there's enough battery storage, enough solar, wind, and hydro, that we are producing and storing significantly more energy than we require, and 
the marginal cost of additional energy is effectively zero, then it may start to make sense. And I know this is ridiculous. To generate energy, e.g. solar, store it in batteries, then use that energy to create hydrogen via water. But it's such a wasteful, ridiculous process. You have to understand that until we're in an era of energy superabundance, where the marginal cost of energy is effectively zero, only where it is absolutely necessary should hydrogen be used as a fuel source. For example, if we already have lithium ion batteries that are totally sufficient and improving for automotive, hydrogen in automotive makes zero fucking sense. Don't tell Nicola. These simplified assumptions for industrial demand result in a global demand of 150 megatons a year of green hydrogen. And sourcing this from electrolysis requires an estimated 7.2 petawatt hours a year of sustainably generated electricity. Skipping ahead just a little bit, the modeled US hydrogen storage requires around 30% of existing US underground gas storage facilities. So in other words, we've already got three times as much underground storage for gases, which can include hydrogen, as is necessary. We've kind of got a bit of a hermit crab situation going on here. The hydrogen can effectively crawl into the now freed up underground gas storage facilities. Five, sustainably fuel planes and boats. People are gonna get a bit excited about this. Short distance flights can also be electrified through optimized aircraft design and flight trajectory at today's battery energy densities. This is very important. A lot of people have this idea in their head. Battery powered planes, yeah, that's a long way away. It's already feasible today for short haul flights. Not for long haul, but that's in just a moment. Longer distance flights, estimated as 80% of air travel energy consumption, can be powered by synthetic fuels generated from excess renewable electricity, leveraging the fissure torch process. Now again, when we're talking about excess renewable electricity, this is exactly what I was referring to a moment ago. The only situation in which it makes sense to be doing hydrogen electrolysis, other than where it's absolutely necessary, is when we have an excess, an abundance of energy. The same will be true for boats and planes. And again, if you guys and girls want more on this era of energy superabundance we'll soon be entering, check out the research by Rethink X. Manufacture the sustainable energy economy. This refers to the energy, the electricity needed to actually create the products to transition the world to sustainable energy, including solar panels, wind turbines, and batteries. Now, what we're looking at here, total energy demand in the United States, US fully electrified hourly demand. This is throughout the year. And once again, if you wanna nerd out, please feel free. My key takeaway here, to provide reliable year-round power, it is economically optimal to deploy excess solar and wind capacity, which leads to curtailment. Curtailment will happen when one, solar and or wind generation is higher than the electricity demand in a region. Two, storage is full. And three, there is no available transmission capacity to transmit the excess generation to other regions. Now, this is very important and nuanced. I know it's getting a bit nerdy, but let's read on. There is an economic trade-off between building excess renewable energy generation capacity, e.g. building a shitload more solar and wind than we need, building grid storage, e.g. batteries, or expanding transmission capability, e.g. the infrastructure to actually physically transmit energy from point A to point B. And that trade-off may evolve as grid storage technologies mature, but with the assumption modeled, the optimal generation and storage portfolio resulted in 32% curtailment. Now this is interesting. If I recall again, referring to the research by Rethink X here, their recommendation is to overbuild generation and storage. So there's never a point where there isn't enough energy available. And ideally you're able to capture as much of the excess energy as possible and use that. It's almost free after all. A little more on curtailment. For context, curtailment already exists in markets with high renewable energy penetration. In 2020, 19% of the wind generation in Scotland was curtailed. And in 2022, 6% of solar generation in California was curtailed due to operational constraints, such as thermal generators' inability to ramp down below their minimum operating level or local congestion on the transmission system. In other words, there's already a reasonable amount of waste in terms of energy generation, where we're generating energy that we can't even use. Be nice if that energy was stored in a battery. The point is though, curtailment is already a thing and it will continue to be a thing. And importantly, the sustainable energy economy will have an abundance of inexpensive energy for consumers, able to use it during periods of excess, which will impact how and when energy is used. And again, this is super important. Per the previous example of hydrogen electrolysis, this will be some of the use where it isn't economically viable today. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because it's such a wasteful process. But if you have an abundance of inexpensive energy, why not? This is gonna open up a whole raft of new opportunities that people can't even imagine yet. And of course, I'm sure some crypto miners are nutting left, right, and center. And hopefully you haven't fallen asleep yet because things are about to get very juicy. Energy storage technologies evaluated. Again, we're not gonna go over this in a huge amount of detail. Don't wanna to put too many of you to sleep. But what we're looking at here, operating and maintenance costs in terms of kilowatt hour per year for different forms of energy storage, including mechanical, e.g. thermal, pumped hydro, and seasonal hydro, 
chemical, e.g. lithium ion batteries, and hydrogen. Notice something, cheapest cost per kilowatt hour per year. Does anyone notice one of these particular technologies seems to be a little bit more economical than anything else on here and it's no fucking contest? That would be lithium ion batteries, imagine that. Anyone ever heard some guy on the internet use the phrase economic inevitability when describing certain technologies because of their costs versus everything else? Yeah, this is what an economic inevitability looks like. We're gonna have a fuckload of lithium ion batteries in the future. Generation technologies evaluated. Same story now for generation rather than storage. We're looking at the same cost per kilowatt hour per year of all these technologies. We've got solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, hydro, nuclear, geothermal. Does anybody notice? What's the smallest number here in terms of cost per kilowatt hour per year? That would be solar. Anyone know any companies that make solar? Seems like there's quite a market for solar. Given the obvious cost advantages of batteries and solar, if I didn't know any better, I would have thought that Tesla had some brains and used them and knew ahead of time that this would be the case and already was the case and had a roadmap to take advantage of this. Model results. These are US only model results. Meeting new electrification demand. For the US, the optimal generation and storage portfolio to meet the electricity demand each hour for the years modeled is shown in the table below. Again, Tesla has done the math. Here is the math. This is what will be necessary for the US. We've got onshore, wind, offshore, solar, nuclear, and hydro. Makes me sad to see nuclear with existing in parentheses. Why? Well, if you read between the lines here, probably not gonna be a whole lot of new nuclear coming online, which is kind of fucking dumb because it's a great source of energy. Once again, if you wanna nerd it out and pause, feel free. We're looking at generation technology here and storage technology here. Importantly, and I mean very importantly, if you own Tesla stock and you haven't fallen asleep yet, please pay very close attention. In addition, 1.2 terawatt hours of distributed stationary batteries are added based on incremental deployments of distributed stationary storage alongside rooftop solar at residential and commercial buildings. Are you listening? This includes storage deployments at 15 million single family homes and storage replacement of at least 200 gigawatts. I encourage you to read between the lines, especially the lines that involve 15 million single family homes. World model results, meeting new electrification demand. Applying the six steps to the world's energy flow would displace all 125 petawatt hours a year of fossil fuels used for energy use and replace them with 66 petawatt hours a year of sustainably generated electricity. Interesting, right? Approximately half as much sustainably generated electricity will be required as today's fossil fuel based energy. Why? We talked about this already greater efficiencies, less loss. An additional four petawatt hours a year of new industry is needed to manufacture the required batteries, solar panels, and wind turbines. Again, for the nerds, feel free to pause and soak this one up. And now, dear viewer, the slide you've all been waiting for. Wakey, wakey. Vehicles. Today, there are 1.4 billion vehicles globally, an annual passenger vehicle production of around 85 million vehicles. So based on pack size assumptions, the vehicle fleet will require around 112 terawatt hours of batteries. For those of you who use the metric system, I think that is a metric fuck ton of batteries. Autonomy has the potential to reduce the global fleet, more on that in a moment, and to reduce annual production required through improved vehicle utilization. So just a quick note on this. This is absolutely true. I do not know which way this goes. Let me explain. If robo taxis are extremely affordable and ubiquitous globally, far less people who previously thought they needed to own a vehicle for personal transportation will need to own one in the future. Therefore, less people may buy vehicles. Makes sense, right? So in theory, very affordable robo taxis will dramatically reduce the number of people who are purchasing a vehicle for their own private use. But at the same time, there are billions of people today on earth in rising economies, billions of them. People who today can't even consider owning a vehicle for personal transportation. Moreover, can't afford taxis, can't afford Ubers. They just can't afford to pay for transportation, period. So there's two different factors happening at the same time here. And I do not know for sure how things play out. I personally model out the global vehicle fleet, including EV adoption. And I have two different scenarios. I've discussed these on Patreon in detail. I have a scenario in which the overall global automotive market temporarily grows to well beyond 100 million vehicles per year and eventually dwindles. And I have another scenario in which we actually see a fairly dramatic decline in vehicle production. Eventually, possibly half the size of today's annual production. Now, I don't know how this plays out, but it's an important point to understand. Autonomy will change everything. Between now and then, there are 1.4 billion internal combustion engine vehicles. Most of them will need to be replaced. And another caveat, a lot of people think, well, hang on, Stephen, if robot taxis are available, they'll be utilized more, they'll do more miles, so wouldn't that mean you don't need to replace all 1.4 billion vehicles on roads? And again, the answer in theory would be yes, but 
and this is a big butt. But yes, who likes big butts? If it costs, let's say, 25 cents per mile when robo taxis are at scale, there will be many more miles driven in robo taxis than there are today in personally driven vehicles. Many more. It could be five times more, 10 times more, 20 times more. Ark Invest have done some research on this. Feel free to check it out. So even with far greater vehicle utilization, if the economics of robo taxis make it viable for many people to use these things previously who wouldn't, total miles driven could increase by five times, 10 times, 20 times. And in that case, we may actually need more vehicles than we'd suspect because the actual market for miles driven on earth per year in a vehicle can dramatically increase. So just flagging that now, got no idea how the f it plays out. I do model different scenarios, but it's important to be aware of this. And as I said, this is the slide you've all been waiting for. We're looking at different vehicle categories, the Tesla equivalent, battery chemistry, battery pack size, annual vehicle sales, existing global fleet, and global fleet in terawatt hours. So vehicle type, compact, Tesla equivalent, coming soon, which we all know. Pack size, 53 kilowatt hours. Now, by the way, I've seen some discussion already happening on Twitter. I just want to address this because I don't want to have to keep repeating myself. Guys, girls, okay? These are not inside details about the current or future battery sizes in Tesla vehicles. They're Tesla's estimates for the average battery pack size required for electric vehicles in this entire category globally, okay? Really important. These are not Tesla product specific. They've done the math on a global fleet of electric vehicles. And assuming LFP battery cathode, pack size on an average compact car globally will be around 53 kilowatt hours. This isn't the battery size in Tesla's compact vehicle. There are 42 million compact vehicles sold globally. 42 million. I think we can understand why Tesla's $25,000 vehicle is gonna be such a game changer. Now, before we move on, you can look at it as 42 million or you can look at it at 686 million existing vehicles. Despite some of the, uh, how do we say this politely? Oh wait, I don't really care about being polite. Despite some of the dingbats in Wall Street, some very intelligent dingbats I might add, who just need to see a demand analysis. We can see here annually, there are 42 million compact vehicles sold per year today. 42 million. Oh, I need to see the demand analysis, but bro, uh, there's 42 million. There's demand for 42 million of them today, Owen. That's when they're more expensive, less safe, worse for the environment. What do you think happens when you can buy a compelling compact vehicle that's better on every metric and cheaper? Is it possible that maybe more than 42 million could be sold in a year? I don't know, I'm just, just saying, maybe think about that. Hypothetically, imagine a random company just hypothetically were to capture 25% of this particular market. You know how many units per year this company would be selling of their compact or compacts? Just over 10 million vehicles. Isn't that interesting? And what if a company, just hypothetically speaking, were to capture maybe about one third of these annual sales? That would be about 15 million vehicles. For some reason, 15 million sounds familiar. Oh, that's right. That's the number that I happen to have in my annual sales potential in my Tesla valuation model for an affordable compact car. Oh, and uh, this is going to be really awkward, but you do realize there's going to be another generation of vehicle after Tesla's $25,000 compact. You do realize this, right? I'm telling you now, late this decade, Tesla will be able to make, not sell, make, Compelling electric vehicle, not that different from Model Y today. Forgive or take about 14, 15 grand, maybe less, maybe 12 and a half, 13 thousand dollars. Maybe they can sell it for 18 or 20k. They may not need to sell it that cheap, but they could. So imagine what might happen to vehicle sales in this category. We already know today at today's prices, mostly ICE vehicles. There's 42 million. What if they're better and cheaper? Yeah, exactly. This could be a lot more. But I still need to see my demand analysis. Wow, that was quite a rant. Now onto the mid-size vehicles. Tesla's equivalent, Model 3 and Model Y. Pack size, 75 kilowatt hours. Vehicle sales, 24 million. Now keep in mind, these are form factors, not price points. But naturally, a compact car, on average, it's smaller, there's less stuff, generally speaking, should be more economical to buy than a mid-size vehicle. 24 million of these sold per year. Commercial and passenger vans. TBD, hmm, commercial van, passenger van. Shout out to my three and a half year old video on Tesla's secret van. It's coming, ladies and gentlemen and it will be glorious. This should surprise absolutely no one. Next, the large sedans, SUVs, and trucks. Tesla's Model S and X and Cybertruck are the equivalents. These will require higher nickel batteries, just like commercial and passenger vans, higher energy density, more expensive. And again, I've seen some people, oh, the Cybertruck battery pack's gonna be bigger than 100 kilowatt hours. As I mentioned, these are Tesla estimates for the average battery pack size in the entire category globally, not just Tesla's own vehicle products, a market of around 9 million. Now, who would have thought that large sedans, SUVs, and trucks combined, annual sales are less than commercial and passenger vans. Most people would not have guessed that. You don't really think about commercial vans, but just check out a city. Look how many fucking vans are everywhere delivering packages, items, and so on. And now, vehicle type, bus. A lot of people busting nuts about this. Uh, you guys remember Tesla's master plan back in 2016? They actually talked about high density passenger transportation. It's in the master plan. It's 
been there since 2016, so no one should be surprised. Now, I personally don't believe Tesla will be producing electric buses. I think instead, they're looking at something a little bit more like the pods we saw a few years ago, boring company tunnels, where you might fit, let's say, a dozen or so passengers in a single pod. This makes much more sense to have many more smaller but higher density forms of transportation than buses. There are exceptions, of course, but most places on Earth, when you look at a bus outside of peak transportation hours, they're almost entirely empty. You might have one or two passengers, if you're lucky, on an entire bus. That's kind of wasteful. Wouldn't it be better to have many more smaller vehicles? I'll be very surprised if we see a Tesla bus, but I will not be surprised at all. In fact, I'll be surprised if we don't see some form of high density passenger transportation from Tesla that might fill the role of what is currently filled by buses. Annual vehicle sales, 1 million. Short range heavy truck, Tesla equivalent, semi-light. Long range, Tesla equivalent, semi-heavy. So the total global vehicle fleet right now, 1.403 million, in other words, 1.4 billion, almost entirely ICE vehicles today. So here's a question. How many of these vehicles will be replaced? And an even more important follow-up question, what percent of those vehicles will be produced by Tesla? Something to consider, because here's the long and short of it. In the future, there will be no new ICE vehicles produced, sold, or operated. Now, these will all be on varying timelines, but that will happen. Somebody needs to make a load of electric vehicles between now and then. I wonder who will make many of those vehicles. Any ideas? Let me know in the comments below, because I certainly don't know. If I did, I might buy their stock. Could be an opportunity. This is reworked from the original slide in Tesla's Master Plan 3 presentation at Investor Day 2023. Global electric fleet. 40 million large sedans and SUVs. 380 million mid-size. 20 million semis, etc. 300 million work vehicles. In other words, commercial and passenger vans plus pickup trucks and 700 million compact vehicles, give or take. So again, just ask yourself the question, how many of these vehicles will Tesla be making? Ships and planes. 40 terawatt hours of batteries are needed to electrify the ocean fleet. The assumption is 33% of the fleet will require a higher density nickel and manganese based cathode and 67% of the fleet will only require a lower energy density LFP cathode for aviation. If 20% of the 15,000 narrow-body plane fleet is electrified with 7 megawatt hour packs, then 0.02 terawatt hours of batteries will be required. These are conservative estimates and likely fewer batteries will be needed. Long-range ships, short-range ships and planes, you can see the assumptions here. Many of you will be wondering, will Tesla be making ships and planes? My guess is probably not anytime soon, but they certainly may be supplying the battery cells that go in them. World model results, electrification and transportation batteries. Table nine summarizes the generation and storage portfolio to meet the global electricity demand and the transportation storage required based on the vehicle, ship and plane assumptions. So again, if you guys wanna nerd it out, highly recommended. What we can see here, repower the existing grid, switch to electric vehicles, switch to heat pumps in residential business and industry, electrify high temperature heat delivery, hydrogen, sustainable fuel, planes and boats. By the way, I love the fact that there's a few typos in this document, no f given. And this is the complete energy ecosystem. We have generation, for example, solar, wind. We also have storage. If you guys wanna run through these line by line, feel free. But again, in short, Tesla has done the math. And if you can read between the lines, Tesla's done the math and they're going after a portion of this opportunity. So it's worth doing some math yourself. Vehicle and stationary batteries in terawatt hours. A total 240 terawatt hours required. 23, almost 10% of those terawatt hours repowering the existing grid with renewables. 116 of those terawatt hours switching to electric vehicles. Seven switching to heat pumps. 46 to electrify high temperature heat delivery. Four to sustainably produce hydrogen. 44 to sustainably fuel planes and boats. And now solar and wind farms, same story. 30 terawatts in total, comprised of 11 for repowering the grid, five for switching to EVs, five for switching to heat pumps, three for electrifying high temperature heat delivery, four for sustainably producing hydrogen, and four for sustainable planes and boats. Investment required. Materials that require significant capacity growth are for mining, nickel, lithium, graphite, and copper. For refining, Nickel, lithium, graphite, cobalt, copper, battery grade iron, and manganese. Building the manufacturing infrastructure for the sustainable energy economy will cost $10 trillion, as compared to the, wait for it, 14 trillion projected 20 year spend on fossil fuels at the 2022 investment rate. Did you hear that? It will be cheaper to build the manufacturing infrastructure for the sustainable energy economy than the projected spend on our existing fossil fuel based economy, the one that's already built out. I certainly would not want to be in the fossil fuel industry, just saying. A sustainable energy economy is 60% the cost of continuing fossil fuel investments. Again, I really would not want to be in the fossil fuel industry. You can't compete. It's game f***ing over. Again, we can see here the $10 trillion investment over 20 years to transition the world to sustainable energy. 
completely versus 20 year investment in fossil fuels. Once again, this is a commercial inevitability. No sacrifice, no tree hugging required. Capitalism is gonna sort this one out for us. And now we're looking at investment required, solar panel factories, vehicle factories, wind turbine, you guys can see, right? Let's zoom out. Again, if you wanna nerd it out, pause, soak it up, go for your life. I just wanna focus a couple of things here. Between vehicle factories and battery factories, approximately $2 trillion combined in terms of investment. That's over 20 years. Heat pumps, an initial investment of just $30 billion. Total investment of $60 billion. And check this out. Assume $3 billion manufacturing capex to replace home heat pumps. Conservatively, $30 billion for all heat pumps. You know, uh, we're only a few years away from Tesla printing more than $30 billion in annual profits. And it won't be too much after that that they're producing $30 billion per quarter. I'm not kidding. Check out my Tesla valuation model on Patreon if you want to see the assumptions. Do my best to put you guys to sleep, I know. You want to check out all the details on this page in terms of the mining and refining, etc. Go for your life. Let's just zoom in on vehicle batteries and factories. An interesting measure here, capital intensity per unit, e.g. A vehicle factory, about $10,000 of investment per vehicle. That's in terms of capital expenditure. 89 million vehicles per year produced, $10,000 per vehicle of CapEx equals $890 billion. That's how Tesla's done the numbers. Battery pack factory, $10 million per gigawatt hour per year. You guys can see, right? And recycling, $15 million per gigawatt hour per year of battery recycling capacity. Total required CapEx, $172 billion. This is surprisingly low. Well, I don't know anything about anything, so I shouldn't be surprised if I knew what the fuck I was talking about, but I don't. I'm like, that doesn't seem like a lot. And I thought this slide was worth sharing as well. Land area required. Solar land area requirement is established by the law. Okay, what we're looking at is how much land would be required. This includes solar. This includes wind. We can see a map here showing all the land that would be required for each of these. Solar in green and wind in blue. Now, just in case you happen to be wondering, hey, where the fuck are the blue and the green portions? Now, let's just zoom in a little bit. This is Africa. There's a green speck and there's the blue speck. We're in Europe now. There's the green, there's the blue. In the interest of brevity, I'll skip the geography lesson, pan around, check this one out. Australia, the most hilarious example of all. I'm not even kidding. Look at this. The dots are so small, they don't even fit. There's not a whole lot of land mass required. This has also done the numbers on all of the materials required. Nickel, cobalt, aluminium, or for the people in certain parts of the world, aluminium. Manganese, iron, copper, graphite, you guys can see, right? A lot of people have this perception in their head. Oh my God, we're gonna run out of stuff. There's not enough stuff. Oh my God, help. This is untrue. Check this out. Materials required to build 30 terawatt hours of generation, 240 terawatt hours of storage, and 60 million miles of conductors relative to 2023 USGS estimated resources. In case you're getting lost in the terminology here, these are the percent of the estimated resources currently available on earth of each of these materials that will be necessary. At most, lithium, 20%. Nickel, maybe 12%. Silver, about 12 Zinc, maybe 5%. Importantly, we're looking at global mineral reserve and resource base, correcting public perception. This is what people think happens. Global reserves decrease over time. What actually happens? Global reserves increase over time. Wait, what? How does that work? What's going on here? Let me explain what's going on here. This is called economic incentives. Turns out, when we need to get more stuff, we look for more stuff, and inevitably we discover, wait for it, more stuff. Lithium is the perfect standout example here. Lithium ion batteries, I hate to say the word, exploded over the last decade and a half. They're powering everything from laptops to smartphones to your girlfriend's vibrator. Never mind electric vehicles. Yet at the same time, we've been producing metric fuck tons of lithium ion batteries and using metric fuck tons of lithium, global reserves appear to have increased, getting close to tenfold. Why? Well, we needed stuff. We went looking for the stuff and we found the stuff. So relax, ladies and gentlemen, we'll find more than enough stuff. But remember, we don't even need to find more stuff because at most, based on existing reserves, no more than 20%, and that's for lithium. Nothing to worry about. And now briefly, onto recycling. To support this plan, significant primary material demand growth is required to ramp manufacturing for the sustainable energy economy. This is important. Once the manufacturing facilities are ramped, primary material demand will level out. In other words, once we have enough material in the system, existing batteries, we will then be able to close the loop because those batteries in the future, 20 years from now, can be recycled and you'll retrieve almost 100% of the material that was in the battery in the first place. So you'll no longer need to mine for these materials. Instead, you can, quote, mine them from existing batteries, which is much more efficient. And that's putting it lightly. So this is important because often you'll hear skeptics say, bro, you don't understand that EVs are bad for the environment. You go to the mining and blah, 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 blah. These are people suffering from small brain syndrome who do not understand that over the long term, this is how well things will play out. For a period of, let's call it about 20 years, there will be a shit ton of mining necessary. But after that, 
there won't be any more mining necessary. There'll just be a lot of recycling happening. Raw material demand, we can see this. 2023, significant demand increase as the circuit is filled. 2028, demand growth levels out as recycling volumes increase and vehicle stationary storage markets near saturation. Refining demand will continue to increase with energy consumption and GDP slash population growth, and then demand drops. This is where the loop really closes. We're looking at about a 20 year period, give or take. Conclusion. A fully electrified and sustainable economy is within reach through the actions in this paper. 1. Repower the existing grid with renewables. 2. Switch to electric vehicles. 3. Switch to heat pumps. I just want to say that one more time. Heat pumps. Why do I keep saying heat pumps? I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird. In residential, business and industry. Electrify high temperature head delivery and hydrogen production. <laughs> high temperature head delivery. Uh, I was going to say a very inappropriate joke there. But this obviously means heat. Sustainably fuel planes and boats. Manufacture the sustainable energy economy. Modeling reveals that the electrified and sustainable future is technically feasible and requires less investment and less material extraction than continuing today's unsustainable energy economy. Please let that final sentence sink in. Modeling reveals that the electrified and sustainable future is technically feasible, and here's the kicker, and requires less investment and less material extraction than continuing today's unsustainable energy economy. One more time. This is a commercial inevitability. This is why I want to claw my eyeballs out when governments are forcing things to happen or incentivizing this or that. You don't need to, okay? This is already commercially inevitable. Stay the f*** out of it. Spend the money on something that's more important than virtue signaling. It's going to happen anyway. This is how capitalism works. When it's no longer economically viable to be doing one thing, we stop doing the thing that doesn't make economic sense. In a word, this document is all about hope for the future. There's no need to be worried. We don't need to make major sacrifices. This not only needs to happen, but it will happen. No sacrifice necessary. A lot of hard work between now and then, but it's going to be cheaper and better and amazingly sustainable. Winning, winning, winning. So if you made it this far, congratulations. I think you've got what it takes to be a successful long-term investor. I know for a fact most people didn't make it. They fell asleep, they got bored, too many numbers. In all seriousness, this is a very good sign. We're not done with the hard part. It's now time for a little bit of homework. Please, I implore you, download the full master plan part three document and run through it. Then do some assumptions. What if Tesla sold this many vehicles? They got that percent of that market segment. What if they made heat pumps? How much would they sell them for? What other financial implications? If you take the time to do this exercise, and admittedly, it will require some mental energy, so make sure you got your Athletic Greens AG1. Check out the link in the pinned comment if you don't. But if you take the time to look through the implications here, Tesla has done the math. They've shown the math and we can use Tesla's math to figure out what is the opportunity and then make some assumptions around how much of that opportunity they'll actually capture. Fair warning though, if you do this exercise, you're probably gonna need a mop and bucket. Let's just leave it at that. You guys have gotta try Athletic Greens AG1. It's an excellent way to fill in nutritional gaps, which everybody has. 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source nutrients. It has prebiotics and probiotics, digestive enzymes, and adaptogens to help you cope with stress. Such a simple habit, one scoop, once a day, every day. It's that simple. Athletic Greens AG1 will have you feeling and performing your best. And if it doesn't, there's a 90 day money back guarantee. So what's the worst that can happen? Plus, if you use the link in the pinned comment or head to athleticgreens.com slash SMR, get yourself a one year free supply of vitamin D3 and K2. Here are what some viewers of the channel have to say about their experience with AG1. Day 30 of AG1 and I cannot explain to you how much better I'm feeling. My social anxiety is so much better. I did not expect to help so much, but it has. I feel energized, ready to do things. I've been staying on top of things for the first time in years. If you haven't tried it already, truly try it. I was a skeptic. I did not at all believe it was gonna help and it has significantly. AG1 is totally amazing. No more ibuprofen, no more leg cramps, much less back pain, feeling better and more energy. This is great and I'm only two weeks into AG1. It really works. Thanks, Stephen. You're welcome. I noticed three things with AG1. My chronic heartburn is gone. My digestion is more regular. I have more alertness and I wake up with a raging heart on every morning. I hope you're putting it to good use, my friend. Just received my second pouch of AG1 and find improvement in short-term memory and not napping during the day as I did pre-AG1. Worth the price. Regarding AG1, okay, okay. So I couldn't ignore all the talk. It's been about three months now and I've literally stopped drinking coffee because of it. Not even intentionally, I just don't need it now. Strange. Not that strange, AG1 will meaningfully boost energy, at least in my own experience. That's the biggest benefit I noticed almost immediately. So what are you waiting for? Head to athleticgreens.com slash SMR or use the link in the pinned comment. Start your daily health habit now and let me know how you're feeling in a few weeks. Remember, there's a 90 day money back guarantee. So what have you got to lose? And I really do implore you, if you made it this far, take the time to run through master plan part three in detail.
Run some numbers, but make sure you got something to clean up the mess. Then, if you'd like to unlock over 300 exclusive videos and counting, plus optional access to my Tesla valuation model, with many of my own assumptions out over the next decade, you'll find those over on Patreon. You can join with the card in the corner or the link in the pinned comment. I'll see you over there. Love ya.